In 2012, a woman named Florence Green died. She was 110 years old and the last surviving veteran of World War I. Her death marked a long-delayed, highly symbolic end to an important historical era. But then again, long-delayed, highly symbolic ends to important historical eras happen much more than you might think. You want examples? Here's five. The telegraph was invented in 1844 by a guy named Samuel Morse, and for a long time it was the world's only effective means of long-distance communication. But then some other guy came along and invented the telephone, and suddenly everyone stopped caring. Everyone except the telegraph industry, of course, who went into several decades of denial, hoping that their customers would eventually come crawling back. Western Union, which had been America's preeminent telegraph company in the 19th and 20th centuries, only sent their final telegram in 2006. But the world's final telegram wasn't sent until 2013, when India's long-standing government-run telegraph service officially closed its doors. The headlines were predictable. Latin used to be the language of the British elite, as anyone who's looked at a British coat of arms or university city motto can easily attest. This was the big idea of William the Conqueror, who considered English an unsophisticated peasant language and tried to suppress its use as much as possible in favor of Latin, God's language. British courts continued to use Latin as their dominant language until 1731, at which point Parliament changed the laws and required judges and lawyers to always speak and write in English. But there was also a giant loophole allowing them to continue to use Latin for technical terms, meaning it was still acceptable to go around saying things like the amicus cures pro forma Bile verde was ex post facto corpus delicte on the grounds that the English language lacked the capacity to communicate advanced legal concepts like bad faith or evidence. It was not until 1999 that the use of Latin was completely banned in British civil court, the result of hard-fought lobbying from the self-proclaimed plain English movement. Unfortunately, Latin has yet to be fully abolished in the courtrooms of North America. At least we don't have the wigs, though. The gold standard refers to the ancient idea of using gold as money. Paper money was originally intended to be a sort of government-backed IOU for gold, which meant that the government had to theoretically own as much gold as there was money in circulation. If there was $10 trillion worth of cash floating around, well, that meant that the government had to own $10 trillion worth of gold. Economists eventually concluded that this was a pretty dumb system, since gold is just some stupid rock whose only value is determined by miners and jewelers and dentists, and it's probably not a good thing for a sophisticated economy to tie its entire monetary system to the fluctuating value of rocks. However, for a variety of complex economic reasons, it did take countries a long time to abolish the gold standard. America only formally unlinked its currency with gold during the Nixon administration. The longest holdout, however, was Switzerland, which did not abolish its rock-based monetary system until 1999. But then again, the Swiss have always been known to have a bit of a fetish for this stuff. Now, the guillotine was, of course, the famous murder contraption used during the French Revolution to chop off the heads of anybody who opposed the revolution. This included the king, the queen, the leader of the French Revolution, and the guy who invented the guillotine. Less famous, however, is the fact that the French continued to use the guillotine for much of the next 200 years. Legal use of the thing to murder criminals only officially stopped in 1981. Though in fairness to the French, I should note that no one's head had actually been chopped off since... 1977. Slavery was officially abolished across the United States in 1865 with the passage of the 13th Amendment. This in turn created a huge population of former slaves, some of whom lived very long lives. Since slave owners did not generally keep very good records of slave births, it's quite difficult to determine who was the last formerly enslaved American to die, but a good contender would be Mary Walker. She claimed to have been born into slavery in Alabama in 1848 and died at the age of 121 in 1969. Now, the craziest thing about this story is that Barack Obama was born in 1961. That means it would have been theoretically possible for the first black president of the United States to have met a former slave in his own lifetime. America wasn't the only country to have slavery, of course, or even the last. Brazil was said to be the last country in the so-called civilized world to ban it and only abolish slavery in 1888. The last formerly enslaved Brazilian didn't die until the year 2000, although she also claimed to be 129 years old, which is a little dodgy. It's important, of course, to realize that there are still lots of people living in slavery today, not slavery in the sense of being bought and sold as commodities, but slavery in the sense of forced unpaid labor or sexual servitude. Luckily, there are still plenty of abolitionists out there, too. This Friday is my 31st birthday, and one of the interesting things about getting older is starting to realize how many lasts you will experience in your own lifetime. I mean, I've already seen the end of video stores, dialogue up internet, smoking sections in restaurants, and in a few more years there will be no more living veterans from World War II, no more landline telephones, no more incandescent light bulbs, and assuming I live long enough maybe I'll even see the last mailbox, the last non-self-driving car, the last red-haired person. Oh yeah, that one's happening. Look it up. Can you think of an interesting last that you expect to witness in your lifetime? Write it in the comments below while you still can.